It is the late summer of 1780 in the backwoods of South Carolina. Civil war has broken out, neighbor against neighbor, brother against brother. With the August defeat of the Americans at Camden by the British, the last regular Patriot troops have been routed and driven out. The civilians left behind turn on each other, Patriot sympathizers against those still loyal to the crown. Guerrilla fighting now rages everywhere. Lootings, burnings, and murders are the order of the day. During a single year, more battles and skirmishes will occur here than in the rest of the colonies combined. These people know each other. They hate each other. These are old family feuds. Well, revenge runs deep, my friend. These aren't regular troops. These are backwoodsmen. One American general sums up the civil conflict. The whole country is in danger of being laid waste by the Whigs and Tories who pursue each other with as much relentless fury as beasts of prey. If a stop cannot be put to these massacres, the country will be depopulated, as neither Whig nor Tory can live. With the British military on hand to back the Loyalists, the odds are stacked against the South Carolina Patriots. But then, help comes from an unexpected quarter. Up to this point, the Scotch-Irish had taken no part in the Revolution. But with Buford's massacre, the war had brought, been brought into their backyards, and they decided that they must do something about it. The Scotch-Irish in the South are the descendants of the defenders of London Ferry and Enniskillen. They have fighting in their blood. They are born warriors. Even without support from the regular American military, these civilian patriots and Scots-Irish guerrillas are a powerful combination. Pioneer families who had survived winters, harsh summers, clashes with the Indians. On the frontier, democracy was universal. Young or old, male or female, black or white, if you could survive the frontier, you could almost survive anything including a British invasion of your homeland. The rebels quickly become a thorn in the side of the British. Cornwallis likens being in their midst to sitting naked on a hornet's nest. The rebels burn British equipment, destroy supplies. Under cover of darkness, they creep in and garret the sentries. One of Major Ferguson's officers declares, this distinguished race of men are more savage than the Indians and possess every one of their vices, but not one of their virtues. Though the South is proving difficult to hold, Cornwallis is nonetheless determined to extend the war into North Carolina. He announces a three-pronged thrust northward. Lieutenant Colonel Banastray Tarleton and the British right wing is to march up the coast to the port of Wilmington while Lord Cornwallis advances with the main army towards Charlotte, North Carolina. Ferguson, with his provincial volunteers and loyalist militia, is to sweep to the left, guarding against the frontiersmen west of the Blue Ridge Mountains. The plan will serve a dual purpose, cutting supplies to both the American army in the north and rebels in the south. But on September 8th, as Cornwallis advances towards Charlotte, one of his colonels warns him not to depend too heavily on Ferguson. He is so extremely capricious and violent in his whims that I doubt that it will be possible to keep him to any steady plan. I must prepare you for his breaking out violently. For once he succeeds in maneuvering the militia to his whistle, he seems to want to carry the war into North Carolina himself at once. But as eager as Ferguson may be for a fight, the war is about to come unexpectedly to him. With the British mobilized, the Patriots send urgent messages asking for reinforcements to block their northward march. On August 18th, at Musgrove's Mill on the Ennery River, the call is answered. Patriot militia pour in from the Carolinas. They converge on Ferguson's men, catching them by surprise. The Loyalist militia endures punishing casualties, 63 dead and 90 wounded. Only four Patriots are killed and another eight wounded. Enraged by the attack, Ferguson composes a warning. He tells the rebels to stay out of the war in the Carolinas or else. Ferguson arrived at Gilberton, 
where he told the population that he would soon go over the mountain to arrest all the Whig leaders, hang them, destroy them, and lay waste the countryside with fire and sword. This was exactly the threat that was needed to motivate the over-the-mountain men. The message is received by Colonel Isaac Shelby, one of the rebel leaders. Married to a Scots-Irish woman, Shelby has close ties to the leaders of the clannish over-mountain men. Since the bloody massacre at Waxhaws, they have considered the British a mutual enemy. Shelby saddles his horse and rides some 40 miles to consult with one of his Scots-Irish allies, the leader of the Nolichucky and Watauga River settlements, John Sevier. As one frontiersman describes him, he can outride and outshoot and it is said, outswear, the best and worst of the men who followed him. Shelby and Sevier relay Ferguson's threat to all the over-mountain men living in the Blue Ridge Mountain settlements. These over-the-mountain men and others from this region are frontiersmen. Everything that a frontiersman means. They can fight. They've learned how to fight from the Indians. They are tough. They can eat acorns. They can live off almost anything. These are one tough bunch of mean rascals. That's what they are. The rebels do not take lightly Ferguson's threat to subject their homes to fire and sword. Ferguson's proclamation became a threat that every single rifleman took personally. Now it was their time to wage war against the British. The rebels are to rendezvous at the Sycamore Shoals of the Watauga River on September 25th. They come with their long rifles, their horses, and their seething anger. They gather here, come out of those mountains, come out of those farms, come out of those valleys, and they are people on a mission. It is much like a gathering of the Scottish clans, drawn from the Virginias, the Carolinas, and the farthest western settlements, nearly a thousand in all. The rebels mount their horses and ride eastward, over the snow-covered pass between the Rhone and Yellow Mountains, over the Blue Ridge to the Carolina settlements beyond. They wear fringed and tasseled hunting shirts and carry knives and tomahawks. There is not a uniform, a bayonet, or a tent to be found among them. A veteran of that march later described their mood. Every man considered himself a soldier, he had his horse and his rifle, which he knew how to use. When fighting came on, everyone fought for himself, officers as well as men. The best officers were those who fought best, as among the Indians, the officers were leaders rather than commanders. As they cross over the mountains, they are reinforced by another 350 North Carolinians and another 400 South Carolina militiamen. But Ferguson is well informed by Tory spies of the movements of the Overmountain men. On October 6th, he sends an urgent dispatch to Lord Cornwallis at Charlotte. I am on my march toward you by a road leading from Cherokee Ford north of Kings Mountain. Three or four hundred good soldiers, Pat Dragoons, would finish this business. Something must be done soon. But Cornwallis, ill with a bad cold, does not respond even though he is less than 40 miles away. The usually contentious Tarleton also cannot be lured from his sickbed, for he has a fever as well. Whether it is illness or the enmity Ferguson has earned, Ferguson is on his own. He marches his thousand men eastward toward Kings Mountain, an isolated peak rising out of the wooded countryside. Ferguson selected this ground for his battle site because it reminded him of the Castle Hill in, in Edinburgh, Scotland. It was easy defended, he thought. Throughout the night of October 6th, 910 mounted men, followed by almost as many men on foot, march on Kings Mountain. Ferguson knows they are coming. He could easily retreat the few miles to Cornwallis' encampment at Charlotte, but he will not be moved. Here, at Kings Mountain, he will make his stand.
It is the first week in October, 1780. Two forces are headed toward King's Mountain. They will represent the American and British armies in one of the deciding battles of the Revolution, yet there are few uniforms among them. This conflict will pit American against American, neighbor against neighbor. Taking up arms for the American side is a motley, hardened assortment of frontiersmen and Scots-Irish settlers. For the British, those who still consider themselves Tory loyalists, mostly hardened settlers from the Carolinas. They have been recruited with a fiery challenge issued by British Captain Patrick Ferguson. Unless you wish to be eat up by an inundation of barbarians, I say if you wish to be pinioned, robbed and murdered, and see your wives and daughters in four days abused by the dregs of mankind, in short, if you wish or deserve to live and bear the name of men, grasp your arms in a moment and run to camp. The backwater men have crossed the mountains. If you choose to be pissed upon forever and ever by a set of mongrels, say so at once, and let your women turn their backs upon you and look out for real men to protect them. On October 7th, the rebels reached the woods at the base of King's Mountain. Now was the time to strike a blow for liberty, to eliminate the British threat in the Carolinas, once and for all. They swarmed around the base of the mountain and began their climb, up over the rocks, through the trees and bushes. As Ferguson's men prepare for battle, the Patriots encircle them. The most respected rebel leaders are here. Among them is Colonel Isaac Shelby, the man who first received Ferguson's warning not to join the Patriots. He has recruited several other rebel commanders who bring 400 Virginians and 160 Carolina veterans. Ferguson, who has estranged both British commanders, Colonel Tarleton and Lord Cornwallis, is on his own. Colonel Shelby's instructions to his men are brief. Don't wait for the word of command. Let each one of you be his own officer, taking every care you can of yourselves. If in the woods, shelter yourselves and give them Indian play. Advance from tree to tree, pressing the enemy, and killing and disabling all you can. The resolute Americans push forward up the hill from all sides. Their watchword, shouted as they charge, is Buford, the name of the commander whose troops were butchered at Waxhaws by the British. Ferguson's men hurriedly form ranks and fire, volley after volley. But their position atop the crest sends their shots high. Ferguson, the best shot in the British Army, an innovator of rifle design, will fight this battle with only the inaccurate Brown Bess musket and the bayonet. Ferguson was trying to use the bayonet. He did successfully drive the Americans down at least one time, but he had to retreat back into the, onto the hilltop in order to hold his forces in some kind of formation. Ferguson's men charged down the hill, only to have the Americans disappear before them, falling back to reload and attack again. Ferguson finally realizes that the bayonet charges are unsuccessful against the mountain men who are ascending the mountain top. The Americans' Pennsylvania rifles prove far more accurate than British muskets, and the Tory ranks begin to thin. Ferguson rides along the lines, roaring encouragement. Ferguson with his sword in his left hand and his silver whistle in his mouth, wreaking shrill commands across the mountaintop, sees loyalist forces, raising the white flag, that he charges up, knocks the white flag out of their hands. As the Americans surge toward the crest, they are met by the sight of Virginia Paul. Ferguson's mistress riding toward them. Her compatriot, Virginia Sal, has been killed atop the mountain. The troops allow her to pass. 
And there are those who say she stops long enough to inform the Americans of what Ferguson is wearing, a checkered shirt. The Americans push forward, and Ferguson's desperate men soon find their lines pressed back to back. His men start to retreat and gather in a small circle there on the top of the mountain ridge. As the Patriot forces ascend, they have this group of encircled men caught in a crossfire. Ferguson can do nothing to stop the increasing panic among his thinning ranks. He battles on, refusing to consider surrender. With his silver whistle and checkered shirt, he makes a fine target for American marksmen. At least nine men successfully got off shots at Ferguson. It is said that seven hit him. That sudden blast of seven heavy balls lifted Ferguson up out of the saddle and slammed him from the horse. And as he went down, his foot hung in the stirrup. Ferguson's horse drags him into the American lines and down the hillside. While he lies mortally wounded, an American colonel named Williams approaches to take him prisoner. Two of the loyalists who were eyewitness say, that Ferguson drew a pistol that he had in his belt and pushed it into the stomach of Williams and fired. Ferguson, in a final act of defiance, kills Williams. He is instantly shot by Williams' men. It is the rifle, the accuracy of which Ferguson understood so well, that delivers the fatal bullet. On the mountain crest, the encircled Tories try to surrender, but the Americans pay no heed. They fire deadly shots among the group, even though the men are waving a white flag. The Patriot forces keep yelling, give them Buford's play, give them Buford's play. But this time, it is the Americans who give no quarter. Rifle, tomahawk, and knife take a terrible toll among the helpless Tories, until Shelby and the other colonels regain control over their men. It had all taken but an hour. The Americans have lost less than 50 men while killing 150 British, wounding an equal number and taking some 800 prisoners. The next morning, a burial detail is left to bury the loyalist dead. Ferguson receives a decent burial. The other loyalist forces are placed in shallow graves and covered with rocks and logs and leaves to keep the wolves from eating the flesh. The Overmountain men and Carolina militia, undisciplined to begin with, now become increasingly unmanageable once the battle is won. On Saturday, October 14th, a court-martial is convened in the forest and 36 Tories are sentenced to death. By torchlight, the Patriot mob hangs their prisoners in groups of three, declares one Patriot militiaman, would to God, every tree in the wilderness bore such fruit as that. Shelby and the commanders finally manage to regain control over their men, but not before nine Tories are hanged, their bodies left dangling from the trees. The Patriot forces quickly disperse, the over-mountain men heading back across the Blue Ridge into the back country. But they have turned the tide. News of the victory sweeps the country. Rebels flock to join the cause. British loyalists rethink their position. The British will find no help from Tory sympathizers now. The only way the British can win is if the Tories come out in large numbers. And Kings Mountain is full of intimidation for the Tories. And after Kings Mountain, they quit coming out. Up until this moment, they had always believed that the great army of the British Empire could not be defeated. But this was their first opportunity to see that the determined Americans could and possibly would win this war. Thomas Jefferson is among those who recognizes the importance of the battle fought on King's Mountain. That memorable victory was the joyful annunciation of that turn in the tide of success which terminated the Revolutionary War with the seal of independence. The British push northward is cut off. 
Supplies will continue to flow to Americans in the north and south. A prime opportunity has been lost. The Battle of Kings Mountain suddenly changes the strategy of Cornwallis. With his left flank totally destroyed or captured, he's forced to retreat to Winsboro, South Carolina for the winter, where he would try to gather his forces and assume his invasion of the north. This in turn gave the Patriot forces time to regroup from their major defeats at Charleston and Camden. Cornwallis is shaken. All his grand plans are in disarray. American militiamen flock to the American banner. At the Cowpens on January 17, 1781, troops under the command of Colonel Daniel Morgan crush Bannistrae Tarleton's legion, killing over 100 and capturing 700 more. Cornwallis turns northward toward his fate in the complete surrender of his army at Yorktown, Virginia on October 19, 1781. To Sir Henry Clinton in New York, the road to Yorktown began at Kings Mountain. The instant I heard of Major Ferguson's defeat, I foresaw most of the consequences likely to result from it. The check so encouraged the spirit of rebellion in the Carolinas that it could never be humbled. It was the first link in a chain of evils that followed each other in regular succession until at last ended in the total loss of America. After the battle, settlers avoid Kings Mountain. It has become overrun with wolves who feed on the shallowly buried bodies of Ferguson's men. Eventually, a monument will be built on the mountaintop for the warriors who fought there. But a more fitting epitaph one that could be applied to loyalist and patriot alike, was written by Major Patrick Ferguson at the beginning of the war. The length of our lives is not at our command, however much the manner of them may be. If our Creator enable us to act the part of honor and to conduct ourselves with spirit, probity and humanity, the change to another world, whether now or fifty years hence, will not be for the worse.